Karen Simon is one of the best photographers in the world. Only 32 years old, she has published a series of photography books, including The Innocent and recently An American Index of the Hidden and Unfamiliar, which is also on exhibit in New York at the Whitney Museum. Her photographs have been exhibited in major museums from New York to Berlin. She is a friend, and I have great admiration for her as an artist who has sought her own way with courage and perseverance. I'm pleased to have her here on this program. Welcome. What led you to this book, The Hidden and the Unfamiliar? Well, I think I'm always interested in photography and photographing sites that aren't typically photographed. So something like with Assad, who doesn't normally do portrait settings, that to me was a meaningful photograph to take because it's contributing something new. Because everything feels over-photographed and somewhat disposable, ultimately. So I'm always looking for unseen sites, which is part of photography's role in general, to access things that aren't typically accessed. So an American Index of the Hidden and Familiar is sort of an exaggerated form of that. But it was also a critical time in American history when I think America was seeking secret sites outside of its borders, whether it be weapons of mass destruction or to understand different cultures. And I wanted to look inward during this this important time in my history as an American and uh, find these secret sites within our own borders. All right. Take a look at this. This is the first image we're going to show of your work, and we're going to see a lot of your work here. Yes. This is the interior of the Palace of the Revolution in Cuba. Yes. How did that lead you to this? Well, this, after I had completed The Innocence, which documents cases of wrongful conviction in America, I was trying to figure out what to do next, and I went and looked back at past work I had produced, and this photograph, just I responded to it aesthetically. I find it beautiful just formally in terms of the geometry and the light, but then its impact is so deeply related to the fact that it's this hidden space, that it's in Cuba, it's inaccessible to the public, nobody has really seen it, and I wanted to find spaces that had that combination but again, within our own borders. So I, I sort of, this was a, a, a starting point for that. This was a stimulus to do this, yes. what draws in this book. Yes. We're going to take a look at some of these, and we'll talk more about this. Uh, first picture is a nuclear waste encapsulation and storage facility that is in southwestern Washington state. Yes. So right. this, this picture is actually, those are steel capsules containing nuclear waste that are submerged in water. The water apparently protects humans from the radioactivity. Yeah. And I found this one section that actually looked like a map of the United States of America, it if does. you look closely. No, it does. There's Texas at the so, bottom and New exactly. York on the right. So it was a bit of a find for me. This is a, a very important image in the project, I think, yeah. for ne that exact reason. We'll talk more about this. The next one is um, cryopreservation unit at the Cryonics Institute in Clinton Township, Michigan. And this is a deep part of the project, jumping from something like a government site to something like this, which speaks about our want to have endless life and preserve ourselves. This is, um, there are the uh, cryonics pioneer, uh, Robert Ettinger, his wife and um, daughter are in that capsule, hopefully to be awakened someday to an extended life in good health, free of disease. That is the hope for $35,000. Now, where did, where did you go there? Well, all of these, I choose them. It's, it, this project's actually very personal, although it has all these political elements. It's, I wanted to, I made a list of secret sites that I would personally be interested in seeing, and I had imagined them in different forms because many of them are unphotographed. I didn't know what I was going to get. So, and they would mutate as I learned more about them and when I got to the site and actually saw what the reality was. But, it really is somewhere a domino effect. One leads to another. Others were just interests of mine. And and when you get there, you look for what? I look for something that is going to be seductive, that is going to make a formal. My, my photography is large format. It's extremely formal and calculated. I don't take multiple looks at, at, at a site. I pick one particular frame, and I go for it. I try and light it. And I want to seduce a viewer and then have them look further into the facts behind the image. But first and foremost, it has to be seductive. So uh, I'm looking for something that formally succeeds. It's also an elaborate process for you. Yes. What an exhausting camera, process. And what kind of camera do you use? It's the, the old kind where yeah. you put the blanket over oh, your you head do. and the negative is this big. It's a 4x5 camera. And 
it's it's not meant for travel like this, and certainly not travel to, um, to do these kinds distant of areas. Because but why do you are, use that camera in an I age like, in which we're all talking about digital cameras and everything else? Right. Because it's so ultimately beautiful when you blow it up large in a museum, which is the ultimate place for me to put my work. Yeah. You, you can see the difference. It sees more than what the eye sees. It has this richness and this texture that is just beautiful. And Why is a museum the place for you to ultimately put your work? Because it's a public forum and I am dictating the context. Although I'm still in the context of a museum, it's not motivated by certain... Um, it doesn't have certain political motivations. It doesn't have uh, financial motivations, although we all know museums do have these, these overarching mm -hmm. things they need to please. It just feels like the purest form in which you can show a photograph. All right. The next one is a 21-year-old patient in Fort Lauderdale where she underwent hymenoplasty. Yes which is an operation to restore the virginal right, state. Right. So this was a Palestinian woman who flew there and to adhere to cultural expectations, wanted to restore the virginal state so when she was married she would be able to bleed. So and you had to get permission from a whole bunch of people, the hospital, her, everybody. I was working with the doctor who performs this surgery quite often and people fly in from all around the world for this. and. Uh, uh, for for a year or so, and he was constantly asking patients if they would be interested in participating in this project. And we finally found a woman who really saw the importance of getting this out there, as long as her anonymity was maintained. Next one is a uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection contraband room at JFK. And this one has a humorous aspect to it, but it's a it's the room in which they seize all of the strange things that people are bringing into our airports. And for me, it also looked a bit like an old still life painting so it had the next one is a white tiger named Kenny yes. the result of selective inbreeding at the Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge and white tigers are such a huge commodity in American culture in Las Vegas and it's a quite uh, violent practice the genetic inbreeding that's required to make a successful white tiger and most of them are born mentally retarded or with physical limitations this Kenny is mentally retarded which you can see when you look at him close up and the next one is uh, Don James who spoke them for compassion and choice in Portland Oregon and he's a he was a terminally ill cancer patient who I photographed right after he had filled his prescription for a lethal dose photographs of individuals in, in those kinds of shots bring me to this. In this book, The Innocents, yes. uh, these were interviews and photographs by you, commentary by Peter Newfield and Barashek, who are part of The Innocents Project. Yes. Uh, they have helped free people on death row. You yes. went out and photographed them. Yes. We'll see a couple of those photographs. Give me the sense of how you approach this as an artist. Okay. Well, my interest in it, first and foremost, was photographic. I had learned from interviewing a couple of these men how photography had contributed to the pro to their uh, their ultimate end, which was potentially losing their life on death row. So, by that I mean many of these were cases of misidentification, where a victim. I'll give you a concrete example. A woman is raped. She's presented with photographs. She has to identify the man who raped her. There, she's given a lineup again and again. The, a photograph repeats itself multiple times and eventually the photograph replaces the memory of the perpetrator if there ever was an accurate memory. So to me it was this amazing sight where you could see the power of a photograph where it could actually in the end end someone's life. So my interest in it was was about photography. And then to even further the ambiguity I took the men back to the scene of the crime where they had never been because they didn't commit the crime. Mm -hmm. So it had all of these layers of truth and fiction, which is so much a part of photography and its history and, and its application in the world. How are so, you different as a photographer today than you were five years ago? Um, I think I'm probably more fearful and paranoid as a person, and I think I've always been that way, and it probably as I see all of these things that I've been experiencing through my photography become even more fearful and paranoid and mistrustful of systems and um, uh, power structures 
And that is what motivates my photography, ultimately. I think it's something that could probably keep me in bed and make me a deep introvert, but instead I've somehow managed to turn it into this need to go out into the world and keep confronting my supposed limitations and photographing and digging deeper and trying to get farther in. So, Do you still feel that when you went to Chechnya, I mean, did... Do you want to go photograph war now? Do you want to go do those kinds of things or are these kinds of things I'm not, uh, prohibitive no. of that kind of journalism photography? Right. I'm not, I'm not invested in risking my life. I'm not interested in going to places where... I'm, I'm also not interested in stolen images. Everything I do is collaborative. Every single location I work with person I work with, there is a collaboration, and that's part of using that big camera. You can't sneak an image. So, and I always try to do it in a very respectful way, and that my, my intention is to give a stage to things that don't receive that sort of stage. So, a war journalist and that sort of photography would never work for me. I'm much more about portraiture or uh, sites, but where there is a, an agreement. I don't, I don't capture moments. I've never taken a camera around with me just randomly snapping. It's always very deeply calculated and deeply thought through. You don't have in your bag or briefcase a purse, a camera no. of any kind? No. I never take pictures. You don't? Mm-mm. I mean, I take an enormous think, number of pictures. I've always thought you might end up as a movie, a filmmaker. Yeah. Have you thought about that? I have thought about it a lot, and I think if I had if I had something I really wanted to tell and do, I would. But we'll see. Great to see you. All right. Great to see you. Thank you. Karen Simon, these are the books. Uh, first of all, you can go uh, to the Whitney Museum yeah. and see an exhibition of these paintings, uh, of these photographs. This is the book, An American Index of the Hidden and Unfamiliar. Uh, there is also <laughs> this book, uh, which you see these extraordinary portraits. And as she said, you see them uh, in the context of location. Uh, these magazines, you continue to do things for New York Times Magazine, I yes, assume? Yes, because I trust the context in which they are placed. I'm not wild about working in magazines, but they seem to mm. honor them well. I haven't mentioned that a, a rather remarkable series of things you did was you went to the tsunami and photographed some extraordinary things there. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karen Simon, we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us.